Um, thanks, everyone, for coming. Thank you, Tom. That was really great. Um, I think you're going to find some connections to be made between these two presentations. Uh, my name is Robert Cowherd. I teach uh, architectural history and architecture and uh, other related courses uh, in Boston at the Wentworth Institute of Technology. Um, and uh, one of the things that I start my classes with is uh, about the issue of student empowerment. And one of the things I was taught by groups I was working with uh, in Indonesia after the uh, tsunami hit was that the natural state of things is not disempowerment. In order for students to be, uh, become in need of empowerment, someone has to first take away the power that naturally accrues to all human beings. So, uh, with that as a reference point, I tell students that you are the world's foremost experts on your own life experience and take ownership of that life experience and that uh, knowledge and that understanding and bring it to everything we do in the classroom. So in that spirit, uh, I want you all to uh, discomfort yourselves out of your chairs and relocate yourselves in this room in clumps. And we're just going to do this for like two or three minutes. Um, so you'll be back to your seats soon enough. But just get ready to stand up and move. Um, there are four. This is like a, how many people have done a spectrum uh, before? Well, uh, OK, so I don't have to explain it and how it's different than the spectrum. Uh, I'm going to present four locations in the room. And we're going to deal with the issue of the automobile and its role in our lives. And this, is, this could be many different issues. Uh, we just choose this one today because my guess is you have an opinion about this. Um, so the first reference point, and uh, this Prezi, uh, think of it as a map of the room where the top of the screen is here. Uh, the left of the screen is over there, the right of the screen is over there, and the bottom of the screen is back there. So get ready to, when you recognize a position that resonates most with you, move to that position. So the first position... I don't know what you just said about all that. Um, well, let me be specific then. Here's a position that might resonate with some people in the room. Personal uh, access to an automobile is the pinnacle of personal freedom convenience, speed, and economy. If that speaks to you, stand up uh, and relocate. There's a little triangular post-it note um, that I planted uh, to mark the location right before we started. And on the other extreme, you might feel that cars uh, are doing a lot of damage, and we got to do something to control it. I think there's a post-it note here. So it's get up and stand and move over to this location if you feel like we need to do something to change. Um, and don't be shy. And then the third position has more to do with how we act and how we move forward. That government regulation needs to intervene and make it right. And then the fourth and final position that's available is that no, we need to leave it to consumer choice. That the market forces will sort out what the right action is. So are those locations clear? Cars are great. Cars are a problem. We need to intervene. We need to let market forces. Now you'll notice that those are not mutually exclusive things. So that's why it's a space. And so if you feel like cars are a problem and there needs to be regulation to control it, you would locate in this corner. If you say, cars are great and we need to leave it to market forces, then that's your location. And so we're hoping to form clumps. Just a clarification, Res when you use the term resonate, do you mean you agree with that? I agree with that. This is what we need to do. And what we're trying to do here as you move into place is you are using, we are using the human body to literally take a position that simply by staying where you are, you are taking a tacit position. And as you move into position, you start to talk to the other people you find there. And your job 
is if this were an actual classroom, your job would be to convince everyone else in the room that action should be taken according to the position that you're in. So uh, just take uh, 60 seconds and, I, and share why it's so important that you guys take control and convince everyone to come where you are. Go. to illustrate why your uh, form, why your position was the correct one. So what kind of stories were you coming up with? Yeah. Well, I shared for the personal experience of, I'm from Michigan, so it's like everyone's connected by the car companies, and my family's in the auto industry. Mm -hmm. So I've just seen a different perspective, I think, this is because of just discussions with my mom and my dad in what they do in their jobs and how certain things help them. Okay. How about other stories? They grew up in the country. We weren't going anywhere with their vehicle. <laughs> Perfect. Um, uh, other stories? Um, I was in the market will determine how wonderful cars are. And um, I have a Tesla. There you go, I had to say. <laughs> now, did anyone share stories of traffic jams and frustrations of traffic jams? Uh, frustrations of getting stuck on the on a subway or in a bus? So, this is one of the reasons I chose this specific topic is because everyone seems to be an expert. Like, humans, especially uh, Americans, are in touch with their own empowerment to have a very strong opinion about this topic. Uh, and so this makes a great demonstration piece. In the classes I teach, we cover a different topic every week. It might be uh, informal settlements in Africa. It might be uh, you know, issues that deal with the physical form of our cities, because I'm teaching, for, a, to, for the most part, I'm teaching architects who are thinking of going beyond architecture into urban design or planning, or if they listen to my advice, they will run for mayor and really have a say in how the world takes shape. But the underlying premise of everything is the world needs help in the coming century. Sorry about that on behalf of my, of my generation. Good luck, but to help you get going, let's practice what if uh, the power to change the world lay in your hands? The most likely scenario for that to happen is for you to start practicing that now in college. And so we talk about lots of different issues, one issue every week, um, and one of them is automobility. 
And so uh, every week they, do, they go through a series of steps um, that uh, brings them to the point where it culminates in trying, informing teams and trying to convince each other of what action can be taken out in the world to shift things and conditions in a positive direction. And so it's really boot camp for game-changing uh, moves that will help the world. And it starts with empathy. It's one of the fundamental professional ethical standards of architecture and other design professions. And so they, we use visual evidence. And this is where the connection with Tom's brilliant presentation comes in. There is only so much you can do with words. There is something powerful about visual evidence and the work you can do with visual evidence to make it a much more convincing uh, argument and case in favor of one outcome or another. Uh, and so we start with the pho photographs, especially photographs where you can imagine what it's like to be a person in the foreground. So here's the foreshortening issue but still see the larger uh, systemic patterns of human habitation in the background. And you see the relationship between what it's like to be an actual human in space and spatial experience in the context of these larger systems, like the, uh, in this case, the, the freeway system, um, et cetera, the zoning re uh, requirements. And so we start to use visual evidence uh, to first and foremost to make sense of what's happening in the world, what are the forces at work, what is it like to be in that, those places, and then uh, developing that evidence, drawing on top of it, uh, how do you figure out what can be done? How do you know that what you're describing uh, is the right move? And one of the really important aspects is to denaturalize these outcomes. So often, we are told that the reason the world is the way it is is because, well, how else could it be? It's the natural outcome of things like market forces and consumer choice. Whereas anything uh, could, there's nothing further from the truth. These things are very deliberate decisions. When we get into issues of zoning rules and segregation, and uh, how schools are more segregated now than ever before in history in the United States. This is not natural forces. These are human systems. It took human system, the design of human systems to create this situation. It's going to take new decisions to get out of it. And so we denaturalize it. And so we go through, I'm going to go through this very quickly because of time. We do things that are familiar in, in college courses. Students read, they write something. They listen to a lecture, and then they, they may uh, analyze something and present. That's the old way of doing it. And it, there's an awful lot of passive activity in that. And we try to move from a passive sequence of events to a more active one. And so um, there are a few skills that we emphasize to activate students so that they are reading actively to create uh, uh, to develop a position uh, and to take ownership of the topic. The real emphasis here is on the last one, where instead of simply presenting their findings, which puts everyone in the class in uh, passive, uh, relaxed mode, it's not a presentation, it's a negotiation. It's a, uh, an exercise in constructing collaborative teams with the idea of empowering and mobilizing action. And we use these techniques that um, are becoming more and more popular uh, in classrooms. Um, the spectrum, which you just experienced a three-dimensional version. I'm not sure what it would be called. Uh, the fishbowl, where the next step in what you were doing is each team would send in their spokesperson, and they would uh, be gathered in the center with the rest of us witnessing and they would debate, each taking a turn to present their evidence and try to convince others. And then they'd rotate out, and a new group would come in the fishbowl. Um, and if necessary, there would be negotiations in the sidebar. And so we're moving uh, from passive to active engagements. 
room, and where even when students are working individually outside of the classroom, it is all in preparation for the moment of truth, which is when they get a chance to convince their classmates, and they either are uh, successful in convincing others or they're not. And so we deal with these big issues that actually they might have a chance at, at negotiating and collaborating on uh, once they graduate. Um, that uh, we try to overcome these uh, presumptions of natural outcomes of history. We try to deal with the visual evidence, which uh, is much more convincing than just blah, blah words, uh, especially when you have the power that, uh, of visual thinking and design thinking that architects typically uh, train for. Uh, and then that it's actually something that could be a subject to critical analysis and available to them when they graduate to actually negotiate in the real world. And so uh, we come back to the Prezi um, as a collaborative workspace in which students are actually, um, let's see. Looking for uh, a present button. I guess that works. And so they develop this visual evidence in, at home, and then they present it in a 60 second video in which they are narrating uh, the story, and they're placing the evidence uh, in a specific location, and they are. See if I can get one. So, so you can see this is a video. Here we go. The luxury of a personal automobile has been a huge benefit to the human. However, the unintended consequences of it have begun to cause urbanistic problems on a regular scale. As seen demonstrated in the city of New York, the privilege of ownership of a car has skyrocketed, and the, dem uh, the demand for parking is less than the demand of parking. While this was not meant to happen, the spread of parking lots must further accommodate those with vehicles. Nassau Community College has thousands of other. So you get the idea. They, they prepare these at home, but when we get to the classroom, they have a pre rehearsed narrative argument that goes with the evidence that they have developed. And they step through the development of the evidence. But when they get to the classroom, uh, unless they're the first person to present their evidence, they are obligated to respond to the discussion that has come before. So rather than presenting what they thought was going to be useful when they were developing these materials at home, we turn the sound off. We play the video so the visual evidence is being shown and displayed, and the students are improvising uh, an argument that responds to the opposition or builds on what their allies had said previously. And so this is uh, a real-time, uh, improvisatory, off-the-cuff, thinking-on-your-feet exercise in, in, power, in rhetorical uh, practice to convince others that certain actions are the right actions to take. And what we find is that uh, some students thrive in this environment and they jump to the front of the line and they try to speak first. Other students hang back. Uh, and we allow students to present collaboratively, uh, jointly. Uh, and they have a way of taking each other's evidence and presenting it in a way that switches the argument up. But it's a very dynamic situation. And uh, students leave the classroom, walk out the door, go down the hall, and they're still talking about it. They're still negotiating. They're still engaged. And often, on a good day, the same students who were doing this as juniors come back as graduate students. And we see some of the same techniques, some of the same analytical basis in their thesis work. And we've now just had the first student graduate and go straight back to Saudi Arabia running for the Constitutive Assembly. Um, he's skipping the mayor. He's going to the national scale. Um, but we, we're hopeful 
that um, we can start to see students use their design skills and their design thinking skills to actually be bold enough as to engage in the negotiations that are required to make the big changes we need in the world. So thank you. Um, so I, we have time for questions. Yeah, so now we'll take until um, for the next seven minutes, we can have Tom and Robert stand up at the front. And if you have any questions, we can just kind of have an open discussion. Not sure this is the right form for this, but um, if teachers trained in universal design for learning and, and inclusive practices and um, accepting all children as children with different uh, learning styles and abilities and strengths and weaknesses, um, if you had grown up in an environment like that, do you think? The teachers would have to redefine success, what success is, right? I, they alluded to that earlier, but um, I got to experiment with UVL a couple of years ago and, and uh, trying to get my district to define uh, success, right? It's a, that's a can of worms they're not willing to open at this point. Um, but defining success, so that's my question. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, I can tell you this, I got into college on a letter of recommendation. I had a college professor tell me, I'm so glad we don't have GPO requirements to get into this college study. Um, to me, personally, I said that, because um, I would have never gotten in. Like, I access and success, the bar, needed to be adjusted for me. Um, I'm lucky, I guess, I can look back and say I'm lucky, but my shirt. It's like I've had enough. It's ridiculous. It's terrible. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so with this lesson that you just gave, it's got visual representation. It's got arguments being made and improvisation. How do you kind of extract a single goal from that when you're presenting this as a lesson to your students? Thinking about this in terms of I'm an English teacher, so writing essays and stuff, there's all these different components, and so I'm wondering how you kind of single out a goal at a time when you're doing something with so many different parts. I don't. Okay. Um, this might be blasphemy, but um, the main goal is to make the whole grading, learning outcomes system uh, secondary, because the students are much more sensitive to the success and failure as judged by their colleagues, whether they were convincing or not so convincing. That is what matters to them. Uh, and hopefully on a good day, the, the fact that I'm there and that we're doing a classroom goes away. 
and they don't notice that so much. Uh, they're so motivated by the need to figure this out, and uh, it's so obvious to them that the right thing to do is like this, and, and so that's what they're focused on, and uh, everything else is collateral benefits that happen to satisfy learning outcomes, I think, better than if the learning outcomes were in the foreground. Mm -hmm. I have to agree with that. I think about like my own experiences in education, and overall, I think I did pretty poorly in school. Nobody was asking me about homework or checking up on me. How I got into college is absolutely beyond me. I have no <laughs> idea how. I think about what I learned, and I'm like, I must have learned things along the way. But the things that stick in my mind the most are like this program I did that was this youth and government program where we went and like stayed in the state house in Boston and like fulfilled different roles of like senators and passed bills and like that's what sticks in my head. That was like le the life changing learning that I experienced. And I see the same thing with my students when I really, I'm a special education teacher so I am compelled to hold on to this objective that I'm supposed to get to. And when I do that, my students are miserable. And when I let that go, and I have more fun, and do more exploration, and put questions on the table, and engage them more, it might be harder for me to sit there and collect data, but they're engaged, and they're lively, and they're happy, and they like me, and they want to work with me. And eventually, it's like they feel so good about themselves that these other pieces seem to come together and fall into place. And so it's a very different approach, and I do personally feel like it takes a little bit of like a, like a faith leap, you know? Like letting go a little bit, and then seeing what the rewards are. Do we have time for one more question? Um, I was going to go back to what you said about success, and um, I'm not in the school district, so it might not apply in a small independent school, but and you talked about the first thing on your list was small things mm -hmm. and thinking about success. Define success within a class instead of looking at it district wide because that's a big, that's a lot to, to take on. But maybe a kid can have success in a classroom where it's defined for them what their success could be and then it builds from there. I would, I would find their own success. I would, yeah. I would add to that that it happens every day, all the time, mm -hmm. and we don't acknowledge it. But we need to acknowledge it as often as possible. Mm -hmm. Successes are happening all the time. Excellent. Well, thank you both so much.